Today I present uh, my uh, research activity on palynology. Uh, my analysis carried out uh, on an high resolution marine core from the central Mediterranean uh, collected in, within the Tyrrhenian uh, Sea. Uh, the aims of our uh, study are to characterize uh, the climate changes of the late Holocene in central Mediterranean uh, from a marine archive with, within a particular, with a particular focus on the last 2,000 years, to define times and mode of the vegetation responses to climate uh, change over the last millennia, and to assess the role of the human activity versus climate uh, in the evolution of the vegetational landscape uh, of the Gulf of Gaeta. This is the drilling point. Uh, where uh, at a depth of 93 meters below the sea level, uh, two cores uh, were collected uh, at a distance uh, of some meters to each other, at a distance uh, from, uh, from the coast of about uh, uh, 20 kilometers. These were collected uh, uh, by the Yamchi Institute of Naples, and the lithology of the cores are characterized by uh, gray hemipelagic uh, silty sediment. The, uh, the methodology applied to the study of the score uh, includes uh, several types of analysis, such as uh, uh, planktonic foraminifera analysis, uh, pollen, uh, pollen analysis, uh, oxygen isotope measures, uh, radionuclide measures, uh, magnetostratigraphy, and tephrostratigraphy. The chronology of the cores are uh, mostly based uh, on the five uh, tephras. Uh, uh, listed uh, in this slide. Uh, the chronology also takes into account uh, uh, measures of the lead and the cesium radionuclide carried out, uh, these analyses were carried out in the upper part of the course. And the magnetostratigraphy was also useful to detect the tephra layers and also to correlate the two cores on the basis of, of a common uh, uh, magnetic susceptibility peak uh, um, detected in, uh, uh, in the two cores uh, corresponding to uh, the Vesuvius uh, tephra layers uh, recorded at the beginning of the 20th century. This is the deep age model of the core, which also was based, uh, including uh, taking into account also biostratigraphic, uh, well dated uh, biostratigraphic event uh, recorded also in our well dated course uh, within the same basin. This uh, is the oxygen isotope and the planktonic foraminifera record, which uh, uh, describe. Uh, the, main, uh, the main changes uh, occurred uh, in the marine environmental uh, environment, uh, and they were uh, uh, described uh, in detail in the publication by Margheritelli et al. in uh, Global and Planetary Change. This is the pollen record, uh, which includes uh, 100 uh, pollen samples, uh, and as you can see, in uh, uh, looking at uh, the blue, the black uh, curve, this is characterized by uh, this black curve represent the arboreal pollen percentage, which gives us uh, an idea of the evolution of the, covers, of the forest cover. And this was characterized by two important uh, um, forest cover decline. Uh, one recorded uh, at around 4.2 kilo year event, uh, kilo year, and the other one uh, at around 2.8 kilo year. Uh, during the last 2,000 year, there were uh, also two other uh, forest decline, one centered at around 1,000 year uh, BP, and the other one at 300, 000, uh, 300 year BP. In the left side, in the right side of, your, uh, um, uh, of this slide, there is also the oxygen isotope record measured within uh, uh, the same core. Uh, for a reason of time, uh, here I described only the forest decline, a focus on the forest decline. For example, this one is those recorded uh, 
uh, at around uh, 4.2 uh, kilo year of BP, which is uh, characterized by a strong uh, decrease, uh, a good decrease, uh, sorry, in the, in the forest uh, uh, record, in the, in the AP record, mostly uh, um, related this forest decline uh, on uh, a decrease uh, in the evergreen uh, vegetation uh, uh, taxa. The human impact uh, in this interval uh, can be considered negligible due to the absence of uh, uh, in pollen indicator of cultivation. Uh, there were only some scattered pollen grain of olea and uh, vitis, uh, mostly related to the pollen production of uh, uh, natural tree population. From the... Um, from this record, the uh, Pantonic and Isotope record, uh, we can retrieve the, the information of a temperature degrees, decrease. The forestation event centered at 4.2 uh, kilo year BP is uh, consistent also with the deforestation, deforestation pattern recorded in uh, Sicily and southern Italy in many sites uh, uh, below 43 degrees. Uh, these sites uh, uh, are mostly located within the evergreen vegetation belt. The other forest decline uh, centered at 2.8 uh, kilo year BP uh, is characterized by an increase uh, in Artemisia and over xerophytes. And uh, also in this case, uh, the human impact uh, can be considered uh, uh, negligible in relation to the presence of a few, a few pollen, uh, uh, human impact pollen indicator. This uh, event uh, is not, do it doesn't find a clear relation uh, and also clear, um, yes, impact in the uh, foraminiferal uh, record, but uh, an increase in the positive, uh, in, uh, positive values uh, in the oxygen isotope can uh, give us the information of a possible uh, decrease in temperature. Uh, this event coincides chronologically with the uh, uh, two with the bond event uh, number two. Another uh, uh, strong decrease in uh, forest cover is recorded during the medieval time. Uh, in this case, also, it's, it is also related uh, to a decrease in broad-lived uh, vegetation. The human impact uh, in this case uh, is represented by chestnut uh, uh, walnut uh, and vitis uh, cultivation and also from uh, also in this case from the foraminiferal and iso oxygen isotope record there is a decrease uh, in temperature a new forest decline is observed also during uh, the little ice age this uh, is uh, particularly uh, uh, clear during uh, uh, the mandor minimum of the solar activity, where also the anthropogenic pollen indicator decrease, uh, particularly decrease. The Mander minimum in the region of uh, Naples, in the Kingdom of Naples, was characterized by an important plague disease which decreased up to 50% the local population. And this could be also an impact in our pollen record. From the plantonic uh, foraminiferan oxy oxygen isotope record, uh, the, we can retrieve the information of a general cold climate uh, conditions, uh, uh, as you can see. This corresponds also with a bond event uh, zero. Due to the fluctuating trend of this, course, of this curve, I decided to apply some statistical tests looking for uh, periodicity probably of cl climate origin. 
I applied the red fit uh, test uh, to it, and I found a strong uh, uh, statistical periodicity at around 1,865 years. I also applied the wavelet uh, uh, transform to the FP uh, to the AP time series, the trend has moved, and also the results of the wavelet transform, transform is uh, uh, consistent with the red fit analysis, showing a density peak centered at 1,860 years of periodicity. Interestingly, uh, these periodicities are also found in several records from the North Atlantic and also in a Mediterranean environment. The Bray et al. reviewing this kind of periodicities uh, suggest that this maybe can be related to an internal forcing, an internal oceanic forcing related to the activity of the thermal in circulation that during the last 5,000 years were really uh, well established. Another uh, similar periodicity was also described by Sun et al. in 2014, and they relate this periodicity to, uh, they found this periodicity in uh, uh, solar uh, proxies of the, um, in the um, proxies of solar activities. And they suggest that this uh, could be also related to a direct impact of solar activity, or they leave also the possibility that this cycle could be related uh, to an internal uh, response of the thermal image circulation to, uh, solar, to a solar forcing. In conclusion, the multiproxy record from the Gulf of Gaeta provides uh, important uh, new insight into climate variability environment, and environmental change occurred in the central Mediterranean during the last 5,000 years. In fact, uh, it gives us the possibility to reconstruct uh, the marine and continental environmental change occurred uh, in this region with a time resolution of from, centennial, from decadal to centennial uh, time scale uh, in phases particularly characterized uh, which correspond chronolog chronologically with the climate changes uh, retrieved also in, uh, uh, at global scale, such as uh, the 4.2 kilo year event and also the mandar minimum of the solar activity. The forest vegetation fluctuation uh, shows a strong statistical periodicity of uh, around 1,800 years, found also in other paleoclimate and environmental proxies worldwide, and this suggests that uh, that could, there could be the influence also of global climate factor, which influence also the Mediterranean environment. Uh, the human impact on the vegetational landscape is clearly detected by pollen analysis, and it appears uh, intense only during the last 2,000 years. Although climate seems to play a major role in determining forest fluctuations, also in historical times. Uh, so, uh, on the whole, uh, our data and our uh, uh, interpretation, although uh, they are particularly restricted for this, call, for this talk, uh, suggest uh, uh, that the central Mediterranean and uh, also the high-resolution marine core collected in this environment could, uh, also, could uh, add very important uh, insight uh, into the understanding of uh, marine and continental ecosystem dynamics uh, uh, from local to global scale. Thank you. As you have shown that during the medieval warm period, if I'm not wrong, and Little Ice Age, you got the human impact evidences based on the anthropogenic pollen grains. Did you find any charcoal uh, indicators over there which has shown the clearance of the forest during that particular period of time? The charcoal is uh, really 
scattered in this kind of sediment. So it is impossible to, it's very difficult to analyze. I tried to do some analysis, but... Uh, uh, you mean to say you got the charcoal evidences there? Uh, I yeah. analyzed some uh, sample, uh, but uh, not uh, uh, on your period of interest, within your period of interest. Actually. And what are the major pollen taxa which indicates the human impact in that particular area? The in our case, there are, for example, uh, uh, primary uh, pollen indicators of cultivation, for example, cereals or cannabache. For example, uh, we found uh, pollen of uh, solanum, uh, mm -hmm. indicating the start of this kind of uh, cultivation that in our area, the area of the pizza napoletana is particularly common. Uh, for example, we found uh, during the last uh, 300 years uh, of the record. Thank you so much. Okay. Hi everyone, buenas tardes a todos. My name is Josu, I'm from the University of the Basque Country and I will talk about the vegetation dynamics and hydrological response to all climate variability in the Iberian range, a synthesis from lacustrine and tufa, tufa records. Okay, during the last decades, there have been an increase in the number of publications in the Iberian, Iberian Peninsula, mainly focusing on pollen records and hydrological proxies but these records have been scattered in terms of biogeographical aspects. Most of the records have been published in the Cantabrian Mountains and the Pyrenees, and few of them are located in continental places and Mediterranean enclaves. Uh, overall, the Cantabrian and Pyrenees uh, biogeographic records follow the typical post-glacial vegetation recovery, and by contrast, the Mediterranean enclaves and mainly dominated by pine woods and xerophyte until practically uh, all the early Holocene period. But uh, what happened in continental Iberia? The continental Iberia do not have, uh, does not have any uh, master sequence uh, to record both the glacial and Holocene period in terms of multi-proxy analysis. And our main goal is to publish new data in order to fill this gap uh, in the inner Iberian landscape. So uh, if we take into account two, two of these maps published by uh, Carrion et al. in Review of Paleobotany and Palynology, we can say that there is a, a master gap in, in the Iberian range and, and the central Ebro of depression, and it's, mainly, uh, and it's mainly explained by the lack of continuous sedimentary sequences, and part uh, particularly most of the uh, records published in this region have been obtained from saline lakes, the paper published by González San Pérez et al. in uh, 98, uh, 208, sorry. And a uh, few of, of these records also are obtained from archaeological sites without a continuum vegetation dynamics. So we need new uh, data trying to correlate both multi-proxy uh, hydrological uh, proxies and pollen records. So my main goal in this presentation is to uh, show you a new record obtained from the Archimedes Palo Lake, uh, south of, of Zaragoza in the, in the Giloca Basin in Teruel, and try to correlate also, also with other records that are located in, in high altitude, altitude elevations of the Iberian range, but also with other geomorphological uh, features, for, ex for example, two layers, that also are uh, the ter terrestrial response to the increase of hydrological um, hydrological conditions. Okay, so which are the main um, biogeographically and climatically, climate features of this huge continental inner Iberian Peninsula landscape? The main, um, the main questions that I, I will try to explain in this uh, contribution is to understand why this kind of landscapes that you will see that are really, really continental from ecological point of view do not uh, show any clear reversal during the high um, stratigraphically well recorded uh, events, like, for example, the Younger Dryas or the 8.2 BP event. Also, uh, our main goal is to obtain broad scale uh, biogeographical or biostratigraphical correlations, trying to explain not only the case of Biar Quemado, but also correlating with other uh, well established pollen profiles, such as, for example, Silex, Via Verde, or Navarres. And finally, uh, our main goal will be 
to understand if this uh, hydrological variability that is observed in our Biartemade of Palo Lake is also correlated by other geomorphological uh, features. Okay, so uh, we, 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 what are the main uh, characteristics of these continental places? The first one is the, that these places in the Iberian Peninsula do not reach to 400 millimeters per year of precipitation. This is really, really, really low values to uh, support broad elements in uh, Indian riverian sequences, especially in the lowlands. Another uh, topic that we have to take into account is that the continental places of the Iberian Peninsula that are located uh, at about 1,000 millimeter, uh, meters above sea level show, uh, shows a clear thermal amplitude between winter and summer times. And therefore, the vegetation uh, is well adapted to this kind of uh, continental climate features, okay? So if we take into account which are the main uh, communities in the surroundings of the Villarcomado Paleo Lake, we can find in the lower, uh, lower environments that both Evergreen and Deciduous Quercus, mainly Quercus Faginea, are the most spread elements together with cropland. Janipers are also one of the most um, represented communities even in, during the, the, this intergulation. So the continental features, even uh, nowadays, are the main, uh, the main landscape features in, 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 in continental Iberia, both in the Ebro Bailey and south of the Ebro Bailey. Okay? While the high altitude environments like the Griegos and Albarracin mountains, pine woods are the main spread elements, Pinus nigra and Pinus silvestris mainly. Okay? So these are the typical communities that we can find in the inner continental Mediterranean enclaves and uh, both uh, evergreen communities will be also uh, the main uh, pollen signature of the, the published uh, records. Okay? So we obtain a master sequence in, in, in this Villarquemado Paleo Lake and the basal, uh, basal sediments uh, dated by radiocarbon data uh, throw a 13 uh, kilojars BP event going linearly until medieval times. We have to say also that uh, pollen profiles and the radiocarbon data has been obtained from two different cores, so the, uh, both biostratigraphically and radiocarbon by radiocarbon data, the DPH model of this sequence is well established, okay? Uh, one of the, another features that I want to uh, show you is that the late glacial and the Holocene transition show a very, very, very high resolution. So um, we analyzed 100 pollen records and we don't found, or we doesn't, we don't found any clear evidence on landscape disturbance uh, to younger dryas or, or, or another um, Added spells, okay? I will show you the result later. So, uh, taking into account the, the XRF results of, the, of this sequence, the Villarquemado Paleo Lake, we can say that the younger dryas until approximately the onset of the Holocene, the sedimentary, uh, the sedimentary uh, indicators um, are mainly composed or are mainly uh, dominated by detrital uh, input, showing a high um, activity of hydrological, uh, hydrological activity in the region. By contrast, the Unit 2, comprising all the Holocene, or practically the early Holocene, mid and late Holocene, are mainly uh, dominated by carbon layers and showing a uh, decrease of, of, of the lake levels. There is a marked hydrological change during mid Holocene times that uh, iron, silicium, and titanium show an increase and we um, interpret like the return of um, return or the establishment, sorry, of uh, humid conditions in the um, at in scale, okay? Finally, during the unit one, we have a deposition of peat in the, in the basin, so uh, we don't have any X XRF data for this, for this um, profile. Taking into account the pollen, pollen profiles, we have analyzed 100 uh, pollen samples, and we show uh, we uh, we uh, reconstruct that during the late glacial and the all of the early Holocene period, we have a landscape dominated by pine woods and shadow fight, but without but without any uh, spread of uh, mesophytes, color blue or color uh, orange for thermophytes 
in the region. Thus, we understand that the region was a really, really, really a stable landscape with the persistence of conifers until practically the mid Holocene times. The mid sorry, the main components in, in this uh, Lake Glacier and near the ocean are the pine with conifers and also the sherophytes, Artemisia, Poesy, and another composite. Okay? During the humid uh, mid Holocene, uh, the main landscape restructuration occurs, and the evergreen communities, the Thidius Quercus, Hasselnut, and Baird communities in the high altitudes, will be the main spread elements in the continental Iberia. And during the late Holocene, the Pinus return, the Thidius Quercus and other mesophytes decrease, and uh, the landscape is mainly dominated by pine woods with evergreen communities, mainly evergreen oak. Okay? Uh, it is uh, interesting also to uh, point that the most important human impact in the region occurred during Roman times. Okay, but uh, is this uh, record particularly to continental Iberia or is it possible to extrapolate a similar uh, vegetation replacement to another places in the Iberian Peninsula? Okay, we can find that for the late glacial and early Holocene period, not only the Archimandro Paleolake, but also other sequences located in the Iberian Range and south of the Iberian Range, like Navarres, Villaverde, and Siles, show similar vegetation landscape. Conifers and xerophytes will be the most important landscape, uh, landscape components during this time, and uh, the xero uh, and the mesothermophytes will be uh, the main landscape components during mid Holocene and late Holocene times, but not during the, during the onset of the Holocene. So we have a persistence of conifer communities with shared communities until approximately 8, 000, 8 kilo years BP, okay? During the mid Holocene, increase, uh, there is an increase in human conditions and there is an uh, spread of uh, deciduous in the lowlands and uh, deciduous also in high altitudes. During the late Holocene, there is a return of arid conditions in, in the Iberian Peninsula, and we have a return of, of pine woods and other conifers. Okay, during the mid Holocene, uh, as I told you before, there is a spread of, of uh, deciduous quercus in high altitude, one, while in the lowlands, we have a uh, a strong representation of Quercus communities. But what, uh, what happens in, in, another, in other uh, geomorphological and hydrological proxies? We have a, a similar conclusion. During the glacial and the Holocene, we don't have any deposition of tufa buildups in the Iberian Range, probably linked that we have a hydrological stress, and this um, difference between uh, summer and winter times in terms of continuality do not allow the uh, uh, precipitation of carbonate in this region and uh, probably the high evapotranspiration values in summer times do not allow the, the, the deposition of this uh, carbon, uh, carbon or tufa buildups. By contrast, during the mid Holocene, and correlating with the spread of uh, Quercus communities in, at high elevation and the spread of uh, evergreen oaks in the lowlands, we have a massive de deposition of tufa buildups chronologically placed between 10 and 5 kilo years BP. Finally, during the late Holocene, we don't have any tufa, tufa deposition, and therefore this uh, reestablishment of arid conditions also uh, do not allow the precipitation of tufa at regional scales. So uh, this is a, a work that we are trying to complete with more uh, tufa buildups. We are trying to establish more chronologies in the, in, the, in the profiles. And in some cases, we have also obtained pollen from uh, pit layers that uh, confirm this uh, previous pattern, okay? So these uh, two profiles are obtained from tufa layers and the pollen uh, conclusion are quite similar. So uh, in order to finish, we have obtained a new multiprocess based record covering the last uh, 30 kilo years between continental Liberia. Vegetation is mainly defined by resident junipers and pine woods until practically uh, 8 kilo years BP. 
the most uh, humid period in the, in the Iberian Peninsula, in the Iberian, continental Iberian Peninsula, will be the mid Holocene and will uh, comprise the eight until five kilo years uh, BP. Continentality will be the main proxy, or the main driver explaining the vegetation landscape evolution during the Holocene and also in modern times. There's no any marked response to the younger dryers, the 8.2 BP, because the vegetation landscape is well adapted to arid conditions, and therefore the increase in arid conditions by this uh, globally explained space are not possible to detect. And finally, uh, we have a massive tufa build up regionally that are well correlated with the onset of these humid conditions during mid Holocene times. Thank you very much. Gracias a todos. So in the third zone, I mean, the, from the bottom, the first zone, the pinus is increasing. Yeah. Yeah? Yes. And in the next slide. The, Which one? Uh, yeah, second one. OK. Next to this. Sorry? Next to this. Ah, uh, then this one. This one. Artemisia, yeah. Yes. Along with the pinus and the Artemisia is also increasing in this time period. So how could you relate the Artemisia in this particular zone and the time period? The ecology of Artemisia and Pinus silvestris in this region um, show a similar uh, pattern. Pinus silvestris is well adapted to continental climate drivers. So arid spells like the jungle dryas or the real ocean are buffered for these communities. So we think that pine woods in this, um, in this region can uh, establish during the late Holocene and can continue being in the landscape until the onset of humid conditions. Some poesy, Artemisia, and Pinus silvestris that can um, survive very strange continental uh, climates show similar conclusions, so similar. As the Artemisia is an indicator of the uh, aridity conditions, yes. arid conditions, yes, yeah. and as in your this zone, the pinus is also increasing. That shows the cold and arid climate. But at the same time, the poesy has also been recorded uh, in a high frequency. Can you just let me know? Because on this point? poesy in Ebro Bailey is an stepper. Oh, you have not considered for that. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. you. Um, good afternoon. I think I would like to thank uh, uh, all the co-authors of this uh, work for being uh, a great family for me. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to show you preliminary uh, multi-proxy data from uh, a new long sediment core from Padul. So, uh, we all know how important long and, and continuous and high-resolution records are in order to learn about uh, past climate change uh, at orbital and millennial scale changes. And uh, the ice core records from uh, the poles have been amazing providing with a very high resolution and good records showing uh, orbital scale, there's no working, uh, well, orbital scale variability as well as uh, millennial scale variability. This is very clear in the Greenland ice core records with uh, these beautiful DO cycles and uh, Heinrich uh, stadials. But uh, all these records come from high latitudes from the poles, and as we all basically live in the mid-latitudes, we need to find uh, high-resolution, continuous, long records from uh, these areas, and this is not so easy. And in particular, it's not so easy in the Mediterranean area where climate is uh, quite arid, and, well, there's a lack of the, uh, continuous and long uh, records. Um, we're also very interested in uh, studying previous interglacials such as uh, marine isotope stage 5E or stage 11 when climate was even warmer than today so we learn about how environments reacted uh, to those uh, warmer climates so we can plan for the, for the future. But uh, as I said these records are not very uh, abundant in in, in continental areas. And here are some examples. And most of these records in the, in the Mediterranean are located in Italy and Greece. You probably know some of these. And, but there's also one uh, site that is quite interesting. It's the Padul site. It's a peat bog located in southern Spain. And 
this is a, a, a very interesting record because it's located right at the base of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. So this is uh, the Sierra Nevada mountain range and uh, this is the Padul Basin here. And uh, this is one of the highest mountains in the Iberian Peninsula. So we get a little snow there during the summer, uh, not even during the winter time, obviously. And, uh, and this is a, a groundwater fed basin, so it doesn't depend so much on, on surface water. And uh, so the water was there also during the summertime. So you, some of you probably know this site. This is a famous basin and several cores have been taken from the area. Uh, they started taking cores in the 60s, 80s, and uh, the 90s. And um, some papers have been published. And what these rec uh, studies, previous studies show is that there is a long record. It's about a 100 meter long sedimentary sequence. And uh, the previous datings show with this paleomagnetic reversal that uh, we might have uh, one million years uh, recorded in that basin and perhaps continuously. So, you know, very good stuff. And Padul is also very f uh, famous with respect to the pollen point of view and uh, uh, some pollen uh, uh, records have been published. Um, but there is a problem is that the, the chronology for all these long records is always uh, uh, challenging and obviously the, the upper part of the core has was well dated by radio, radiocarbon dating but then the bottom part of the cores were not and uh, so here what I'm showing is uh, two pollen records that showed basically the same vegetation changes but uh, with completely different interpretations so the, the, the first team who went to Padul uh, so some variability, I mean, th this is the Holocene with high development of uh, Mediterranean forest. Then this is the late, late glaciation. And then they, they see some variability uh, lower down in the core that they interpreted as previous interglacials. So we will have several interglacials and in, in glaciations recorded in this core. Well, the French team later on saw the same patterns, but they said that those interglacials weren't interglacials, they were interstadial. So they interpreted this records uh, as a way shorter. So in order to clarify or trying to clarify all this, we went back to Badul and uh, we took several cores that at the beginning, uh, you know, we, we didn't recover the, a good sedimentary sequence, but uh, in, in June and July of 2015, we uh, recovered a good uh, record. It's about 45, 43 meters long, and here it is. It's the Padul 1505 record, and what we can see is a clear uh, lithological cyclicity, so organic sedimentation, basically peat, uh, alternate with uh, marls, and then organic sediments, marls, organic sediments, and marls. So we, uh, you know, when we recorded this core, we're like, oh, we have three cycles, complete cycles, but you know, we need to date this and we need to see if this is true. Now, if we compared our record with uh, previous uh, records, I mean the previous cores taken from the area, we can see a very good correlation between these organic intervals, the marls, and uh, if we look at the previous datings, w uh, you know, we obtain, I mean, we can infer that our record will be about 250, between 250 and 300,000 years old, so uh, a long record. Now we need to date our core, and uh, for the upper part, we have 57 uh, radiocarbon samples. And so this is the edge control for the upper part of the core, which uh, we think is quite good. There is some problems and some old dates and young dates once we reach the carbonates here. But uh, you know, we think we got a, a fairly good edge control for this part of the record. But then we need to date uh, the, the bottom part of the core, the rest of the core. This is just the, the first 10 meters here. so. And uh, we tried to do OSL, but there is no a lot of quartz. And there is no tephras in this area. We already have some uh, uh, amino acid road, road optimization datings that I'll show you later, which uh, 
we have mixed feelings about them. But uh, if we uh, extrapolate these uh, uh, sedimentary uh, rates here to the bottom of the core, we'll have uh, about 250,000 uh, years in this record, which really agree with uh, the previous uh, information. Uh, these are the dates that I was telling you about. These are the amino acid racemization datings that we just got. And uh, they seem to work very well for the Holocene. And then, uh, you know, there's this dating here which uh, seems to work well if we extrapolate the sedimentary, the, the average sedimentary rate. But then we get some, we think, good dates here. But then, right after that, this seems to be a big jump in the in the ages, so uh, maybe there is a, a jump in the ages, and maybe not. We don't see any erosive surfaces or anything like that, and uh, as I said, the previous uh, studies uh, show that, uh, you know, that this, uh, you know, that this, uh, this seems to be continuous. So, I mean, we're still working on this, but uh, we have data from the core. So we already have uh, XRF data here and pollen data. And what we can see, it's important big changes in the vegetation and the, the lithology. And uh, here you can see this is the Holocene, a high development of Mediterranean forest. This is stage one, then stage two with steppe vegetation, so very arid environment. Then here there's a warming, maybe stage three. Yeah, this could be even five but this is very low step uh, vegetation at that time. And then something that looks like stage four with step vegetation and very high values of Mediterranean forest at this time, which we think uh, is, will be stage 5E. And uh, later on, there is uh, a peak in step elements, which is uh, probably sta stage six. And then this is not so clear, maybe it's stage seven, but uh, you know, so, we believe we have, uh, perhaps we have three complete cycles in this, in this core. Um, if, we, if we look at this, uh, the age, I mean the depth for this stage 5E, and we look at the amino acid racemization data, this falls right where we have a bunch of uh, datings that seem to support this uh, this hypothesis, okay? So this is to be an agreement within the, uh, between the edge controls and the main climatic events. Now, for the part that it's already uh, well dated, the upper part of the core, uh, this is the edge control, and uh, this is the, the XRF data. Besides these orbital scale changes, these uh, three cycles that we see, we also see millennial scale variability. This is the silicium, or silica, and we see some big uh, peaks right at the time of uh, Heinrich events, so maybe uh, arid events, and maybe there was more erosion and more detritic input into the lake. And uh, this is very clear in this uh, core. May we even see the events, but we haven't really looked. Uh, this is all recent preliminary data, so we're still, we're still working on that. And this variability seems to be very clear, too, during the Holocene. These are the main elements that we uh, see in our core. So um, some variability that seems to, to, uh, to show, I mean, to agree very well with uh, climatic events in the Holocene. Uh, we also have high resolution pollen data already for the late glacial and the deglaciation and uh, the Holocene. And there's two PhD students who are here and are presenting posters today and, and Friday. So this is John here. Uh, and uh, he's worked on the uh, deglaciation from this core. And we see uh, this uh, millennial scale variability very clearly in the pollen with uh, Heinrich uh, status very clear with a step development of step vegetation. And then the balling Aller Road with this warming here, this development of uh, Mediterranean forest, then again cooling during the Jagen Dryas, and then. Uh, uh, very significant warming during the Holocene, the early Holocene, showing the warmest and most humid conditions. And these pollen uh, results really agree with uh, the rest of the proxies, the geochemistry and magnetic susceptibility. So we're very happy about these uh, results. 
And there's another PhD student, this is Marie Jose, who's presenting a poster on, on Friday too. And she's done a high resolution analysis for the Holocene. And so what we can see is the warmest and, and the most humid conditions in the early Holocene. And then obviously, I mean, we also see some uh, very clear variability. And in the polling showing millennia scale variability, the Iberian Roman humid period, very clear in this record as well. Uh, what I'm showing you here is uh, this black plot is the uh, the Mediterranean forest from Padul, and compared to this is uh, uh, arboreal pollen from the Sierra Nevada. We already have data from uh, uh, higher elevation sites in, the, in, in that area too. And if we compare the, the two plots, there is very strong similarities showing the, the highest development of Mediterranean forest, forest in general during the early Holocene, and then uh, deforestation during the mid and late Holocene, and very clear uh, variability to uh, this is the Iberian Roman humid period. So very cool stuff. Mm, well, I'm going to go through this slide very fast. So. Uh, this is all very preliminary data, and there's a lot of people working on this uh, project, and we're all very excited about it, and hopefully we get some papers published soon, and thank you. You just mentioned now at the very end that the, the Padul record for the, last, the, late, the latest part of the Holocene, this uh, trend was the result of the deforestation. My question is, uh, are you convinced that only deforestation is not a climatic signal behind, or could be the mixture of both of them, or you have solid evidences that it's, it's purely deforestation? Yes, well, thank you. Um, I meant to say that that was uh, basically climate. We think that is basically climate. I mean, obviously, there is a human impact there, too, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe I forgot, so, sorry. sorry. it was my mistake. For some reason, I, I understood what's the uh, deforestation due to human activity. Yeah. So, so, sorry, thanks. Uh, yes, I'm uh, going to speak about uh, some of the same regions that uh, Gonzalo just spoke about, uh, a little bit higher in elevation. Um, I'm one of a group of people, uh, just about the same people that uh, uh, was, uh, were the authors in the previous uh, talk. Um, um, that have been working as an interdisciplinary uh, international team uh, to look at uh, vegetation change and environmental change at uh, high elevation in the Sierra Nevada. Um, I'm going to put a plug in here too for our colleagues because uh, uh, you know my intention for this talk is to um, is to provide a little bit of an overview on some recent thoughts. Uh, specifically for site uh, at high elevation Laguna de Rio Seco. Um, but there, there are lots of good posters that are being presented this week as well. And if you have time to visit them, these are some of the ones that are also involved in uh, uh, authors in our group. My talk today is, uh, I'm going to sp uh, spend a few minutes talking about uh, introductory information about the high elevations in Sierra Nevada and location of some of these sites at high elevation. Uh, then I'm going to launch into a discussion of climate and vegetation environmental change, uh, specifically from this one site. And then at the end, talk about anthropogenic influences uh, d deduced from these high elevation sediments. Um, most of you are aware the, southern, the Sierra Nevada is the southernmost alpine mountain chain uh, in Europe with with heights up to about uh, almost 3,500 meters uh, at Mulhussein, which is the tallest peak. One of the things that, um, that really attracted me to work in this particular location was the fact that this range is in southern, in southern Europe, but very close to the northern uh, African um, uh, continent. And so um, the record, we think, is, is able to pick up some relatively large climatic uh, changes that have happened during during the Holocene, specifically looking at the, uh, the movement of the ITCZ in the African humid period. The second thing that attracted me is that this area has a large number of endemic species, about 60 endemic species, 116 threatened species of plants, and within the Sierra Nevada Park at the, top, at the uh, highest elevations, some 2,100 species. So it's a very sensitive, potentially sensitive region 
for looking at vegetation change in the future just as it is in the past. Um, and a third reason is because of the long historic and prehistoric record of human interactions in this part of the world. Um, of course, the largest city close, uh, close to the Sierra Nevada today is Granada at about 240,000 people. But this area has been home to uh, various civilizations at least since the Neolithic times with the Iberian people and successive waves, as, as most of you people are aware, of Romans, um, uh, Visigoths, and in the 8th century, uh, North African uh, uh, Moorish people, and then finally during the Reconquest in the 15th century, um, the Christians. So there's been a lot of uh, cultural change in this location as well, which is really quite interesting to me. Um, these are some of the sites that, uh, that we've been working on. Um, there are more than 50 small lakes, uh, primarily of glacial origin. The basins are primarily glacial origin between about 2,500 meters elevation and 3,100 meters elevation, um, and a lot of wetlands as well. And the goal of this project has been to sample the diversity of habitats at these high elevation sites on both, both the north and the south facing slopes, and ultimately to build up a picture of landscape scale environmental change in this mountain range during the Holocene. And, we're getting closer uh, with every year. Okay, so I'm going to launch now into looking at the longest record that we have at high elevation, uh, which is Laguna de Rio Seco. This record um, goes back to the beginning of the Holocene, perhaps a little bit uh, beyond that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we've divided it up into uh, five uh, pollen zones. This lower pollen zone um, is at, at the, at the, uh, the origina origination of the record here up until about 10.6 uh, Ka, um, where uh, vegetation at high elevation was largely a steppe vegetation dominated by uh, pollen of Artemisia and members of the Amaranthaceae. Um, as we move up a little bit later into the, uh, uh, into the um, early Holocene, from about 10.6 uh, to 7.8, we see that the dominant pollen type is, is pine, but there's also uh, several pollen types that are deciduous um, uh, trees, betula and of course Quercus, that are common at this time period. Uh, and in addition to that, um, indicators of relative uh, high lake levels, the highest lake levels are found at this time, as well as uh, wetland indicators, so it was relatively wet in the early part of this record. As we move up into uh, beyond uh, 7.8 to about 5.8 um, uh, thousand years ago, um, we see we're still in a, in a pine maximum um, right here, but we're beginning to see some of these uh, deciduous trees uh, 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 disappearing uh, in the pollen record. And we're also, oops, sorry, we're also beginning to see a decline in some of these aquatic indicators and maybe even some of the uh, indicators of, of the uh, surrounding uh, bog of this. So we're beginning to dry out a little bit. And then clearly after uh, 5.8 thousand years ago, we see a decline in pine and we see an in, in, uh, increase in xerophytes, specifically Artemisia, especially after about 27 a hundred years ago. And most of the indicators of, keep hitting the wrong button, sorry. Most of the indicators of permanent water uh, or at least reduced uh, lake levels, uh, are, uh, uh, most of those indicators suggest reduced lake levels. The la very last uh, uh, pollen zone is the last uh, most recent 200 years. And the distinguishing characteristic here is uh, this increase in uh, olive, of course, this part of Spain has very high uh, a degree of land covered by olive plantations. And so we picked that up at these high elevation sites. And remember that a lot of this is happening at lower elevation. It's just being picked up at high elevation. Okay, one of the things that, that's been really important is looking at the um, input of the aeolian, aeolian input into these, uh, these high elevation sites. And this is largely the work of uh, 
of uh, Francis Jimenez uh, Espejo. And what Francis has been able to do is to look at the heavy metal concentration uh, in the dust fraction of these alien fraction. And uh, we, uh, I'll just show a couple of curves associated with that. Here is the pollen record again, showing relatively wet conditions in the early part of the Holocene in green and uh, more xeric conditions in the latter part of the Holocene as well. And so the atmospheric dust record um, uh, is shows a, um, the ratio between zirconium and thorium. In the early part of the record, there are fewer heavy metals uh, as shown by this ratio and thus less, uh, less African dust, which goes along with uh, more uh, wetter conditions, uh, perhaps during the African humid period. As we move up into the later Holocene, that ratio changes. Uh, it's more enriched in heavy uh, minerals, and there's more African dust. The carbon nitrogen ratio is very, is, uh, shows a similar pattern. Um, we have uh, in the lower part of the record a lower carbon nitrogen ratio means less a terrestrial input, more aquatic input into the record, and then that is re reversed in the late Holocene. A higher carbon nitrogen ratio suggests uh, um, uh, greater terrestrial input and less aquatic input. And then the, the long chain biomarkers um, that have been worked on by Jamie uh, uh, Tony and Antonio uh, Garcia Alex um, show a very similar pattern. We see uh, during the early Holocene um, uh, lower uh, uh, concentrations of these long chains uh, suggesting wetter conditions with less terrestrial input, and then that is reversed for the, uh, for the later part of the Holocene. So all of these indicators are, are suggesting, of course, the same, the same thing. Um, so Laguna de Rio Seco was, at the, was somewhere near the, the northern uh, extension of the effects of the early Holocene uh, African humid period, it's pretty clear. But what was the nature of that transition uh, out of the humid period? And did the NAO, uh, NAO have anything to do with this? Um, just to review the African humid period and what we're really seeing here, this is, of course, the migration of the ITCZ further to the north. And during the early Holocene, we see the summer insulation maximum at this, this, uh, this latitude, an expansion northward of the ITCZ with greater moisture uh, input into the north, more extensive vegetation uh, cover for North Africa and also in Iberia, and less dust. And as we move into the mid to late Holocene, we see a sort of a contraction of that. Uh, the solar insulation maximum is waning, uh, the contraction of the ITC Z uh, further to the south, which means less moisture to the north and less extensive vegetation cover for North Africa and consequently more uh, African dust. So, um, you know, the, uh, the, um, uh, w one way to look at this, of course, is to look at the, the Kiriako Basin record, which clearly shows a, a very nice correlation with insulation, also showing the position of the ITCZ. Um, but if we, if we look at a variety of, of, of proxies of, of the, IT, uh, the ITCZ, or the end of the African humid period here, we see um, that at least some of them show a relatively abrupt end of the African humid period, as shown by this uh, article in 2000 by Domenico et al. Uh, on the other hand, uh, another article that just came out recently this year um, from Tanzania shows a uh, more uh, uh, gradual uh, decline in the African humid period, two phases, as shown by the arrows here. So what is it for, uh, for this read, for uh, uh, Laguna de Rio Seco? Um, so what I've graphed here are, are Two, a one pollen type and a, a group of wetland pollen types. This is, this is the um, pollen of, of Betula uh, pendula, a, sub, a subspecies, a relatively rare subspecies found in, uh, in Morocco and also in, in the southern part of the Iberian Peninsula. It's rare today, um, probably was reasonably rare uh, uh, in the early Holocene as well. But you can see from the, the curve here that there, there's a relatively uh, abundant relative abundance of the birch, the betula uh, during the early Holocene, and a step function 
that shows something very similar to, uh, to a two-phase decline in the African humid period. The same thing for wetland pollen types um, showing a, a, a sort of a step function here as well, uh, suggesting uh, a gradual pullback. And perhaps this was tension between the developing aridification events of the positive NAO. This, this comes from work that uh, Will Fletcher and all have done, um, suggesting that uh, during this period of time, during these phases, uh, these step functions, that there was extended period perhaps of, of dryness uh, in this particular uh, area. Okay, so my, I'll just have one more slide and then I'll stop. I just want to say something real quickly about um, anthropogenic influences at this high elevation site. They include evidence of mining, land clearance, and agropastoralism. And um, if we just put all of this together, this is the last 6,000 years here. This upper uh, curve shows a work that Antonio Garcia Alex has done on the, uh, uh, the lead concentrations in this curve, showing the, during the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, uh, Iberian smelting was occurring at low elevation, undoubtedly. This is the uh, peak during, of Roman smelting during the Roman Empire. And then the, in the last century or so, uh, the Industrial Revolution and leaded gasoline. In terms of light, uh, land clearance, we see a, a charcoal record that seems to pick up right about the same time as, um, as smelting uh, and at the same time as a decline in pine is occurring. Of course, this is a, a combination of climatic events as well as uh, hu caused by human, human clearance. And then more, uh, more appropriately in agropastoralism, these four graphs right here, the sporomyella uh, percentage, which is a, which is a dung fungus uh, produced by the dung of grazing animals, um, the uh, percent of ruderal plants, uh, waste, waste plants, an increasing aridity, and also uh, 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 of, of this a step, uh, perhaps as a result of grazing, and then uh, several peaks in olive, uh, olive here, perhaps related to human activities, certainly related to agribusiness uh, over the last uh, century or so uh, at lower elevation. Okay, so just in summary, um, I, I see that my formatting didn't work very well here. Um, in summary, we have a, a steppe vegetation, cold and dry conditions in the earliest part of the Holocene uh, from 10.6 to 7.8, an increase in pine and herbaceous trees, suggesting this was the wettest time period with less Sahara dust, a high uh, uh, autochthamous organic matter deposition, very little burning, and an ITCZ expansion northward. Uh, in the middle Holocene, still a pine maximum, but reduced deciduous trees uh, during this transition to drying, lowered lake levels, uh, and uh, perhaps a change in climatic, um, uh, climatic uh, phenomenon. But during the late Holocene, a reduction in pine, an increase in high altitude shrubs. Sahara dust is high with high evaporation. Human impact is greater, lots of grazing, burning, and mining, and perhaps uh, an ICTCZ further contraction. Um, and I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much. Just, just to comment on the ITCZ, um, I think a lot of Mediterranean areas do show evidence of a, a wetter climate in the early mid-Holocene, but I, I don't think we can attribute it to the ITCZ reaching this kind of latitude. I mean, it may have, it definitely moved north, but the source of precipitation was not the monsoon. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, you, you physically can't get the precipitation as far north as this. It has to be an Atlantic source. So then that raises some interesting questions about interaction between right. temperate and tropical sources. But I think, and there may have been some interaction between the two, but I think um, it, it wasn't monsoonal. Okay. That's, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. We'll have to do some more work on that. Yeah, I'd like to talk today about the um, paleovegetation and paleoclimate of the southern Levant during marine isotope stage two. And uh, this project was a part of my PhD studies, but it's still an ongoing project. So our working area is the southern Levant, which is situated in the southeastern Mediterranean region. 
And as you can see on this map here, um, the southern Levant is characterized by a steep topography. And there are two large water bodies, um, the Sea of Galilee and also the Dead Sea. Um, both are connected via the Jordan River. Um, the southern Levant um, is also characterized by a steep environmental gradient. This gradient you can see even better on these maps. Uh, on the left hand side, there's a precipitation map, and you can see that here in the northern part, there's a lot of precipitation. So, for example, at uh, Mount Hermon in the north, um, there are more than 1,300 millimeter of precipitation. But here in the south, in Elat, there's only 20 millimeter uh, precipitation um, in one year. So following this steep gradient in precipitation, um, the vegetation is also adapted um, to this. So in the northern part, here in green, we uh, have the Mediterranean woodland, which is characterized by a variety of trees and shrubs, for example, evergreen and deciduous oaks. And then at the transition, um, there's Uranoterranean steppe vegetation, which is dominated by Artemisia. And in the south, there is Sahara Arabian desert vegetation, which is a very sparse vegetation, but uh, common plants are kinopodes. And um, at last, there's also the Zidanian vegetation type, but this type is not related to the precipitation gradient, but it's rather adapted to the local water availability. So it's a typical oasis vegetation um, with trees like acacia. So we are studying MIS too because this was a very special period uh, in the southern Levant. As you can see, the lake levels were very high during this, region, uh, during this time. Um, here, for example, the Dead Sea lake level was about 400 meters um, below mean sea level during the Holocene. But here during the last glacial, and in particular during MIS-2, it was about 240 meters higher than during um, the Holocene. And also the Sea of Galilee was um, much higher than today, and both lakes uh, even merged during this time and formed this mega lake, uh, Lake Lisan here, which you can see on this map. However, the underlying climatic conditions which caused these hydrological um, circumstances are still not fully understood. And also the paleovegetation, which is of course a very important uh, indicator for the paleo climate, is also not very well understood. So our questions we wanted to answer were which vegetation types prevailed during MIS2, and also um, was there a similar environmental gradient as we can see it today? And to answer these questions, we had a look at the pollen at two different uh, sites. So first of all, at the Sea of Galilee and also at the Dead Sea. The hypothesis we had in mind by doing answering these questions was that if more precipitation would have um, caused the high lake levels, we would, um, yeah, we would think that a dominance of dense Mediterranean woodland would be the case during MIS-2. So we, we would expect a spread of trees and shrubs. And this hypothesis is actually um, the most common hypothesis we find in the literature, not only to explain the hydrological conditions, um, but also as a hypothesis for the paleovegetation during this time. But on the other hand, it could also be that less evaporation was um, the driving factor of these conditions. So um, that, lower uh, that lower temperatures and lower insulation during the last glacial um, caused less evaporation. And even with the same amount of precipitation or even less, um, this could cause a positive water balance. And under these conditions, we would expect dominance of steppe vegetation. 
So to answer the questions, we had a look at a sediment core that was drilled at the Sea of Galilee here at the um, archaeological site of Ahalo II. And this, course, uh, this core enables us to have a detailed look at the MIS-2 sediments when um, the lake level was higher than today. So here are the palm results uh, for this core. Um, here shown in percentages. And I um, want to focus on this part here between 28 and um, 24,000 years before present because um, this was the time of the highest lake level and here the palm many present the regional vegetation. And as you can see, there is a dominance of steppe vegetation. So for example, there are chenopodes and grasses, Artemisia and also other Asteraceae. And there is all, uh, there's just a limited amount um, of trees and shrubs, so mainly um, deciduous oaks, but they did not form a dense Mediterranean woodland. They did rather form some stands of oak woodland and were rather patchily distributed in um, the area. So overall, um, these results suggest semi-arid conditions. And this, of course, very different to the Holocene picture, which we find um, at the Sea of Galilee. Here I compare the data of the Holocene um, with my data from the MIS-2 part. And during the Holocene, there were up to 60% um, of trees and shrubs um, in the region. But here you have to consider a huge human impact. So there was always um, agriculture and a lot of settlements. But during the last glacier, there were only up to um, about 30% uh, of trees and shrubs, so much less. So this um, tells us that less water was ava available for uh, the plants. So now I'd like to compare these results to the results from the Dead Sea. Here I worked um, at a core which was drilled at the ICDP campaign in 2010. And this core um, originates here from the center of the Dead Sea. And it covers um, yeah, about uh, 455 meters of sediment, uh, which yeah, covered the last 220,000 years before present. Uh, but I just focused on the last glacial part of this core. And here I'd like to focus on the MIS-2 part of the core. So again, um, the pollen percentages. Um, so here, this is the MIS-2 part of the record. And as you can see, again, herbaceous taxa dominate. So xenopodes, grasses, and artemisia were very common. There were, again, um, also some trees and shrubs. So deciduous oaks, for example, but also juniperous type but um, they did not form a dense Mediterranean woodland. They, again, just rather appeared patchily in the landscape. So this tells us that at both sides, at the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, the vegetation was quite similar. And we do not find a strong environmental gradient uh, like we see it today. And here I also like to point to another thing um, that we uh, find good correlation between uh, the pollen record and the lake level curve. So um, this was the time when the lake level dropped dramatically. And we can see that um, xenopodes um, spread a lot during this time. So this is probably because the margins of the lake exposed and the xenopods could grow there very well because they are adapted to the salty soils. Um, and so we find here um, a local signal of the vegetation and this causes a, a suppression of other taxa. So we think that this is not a setback of the forest, but it's rather a statistical um, 
yeah, thing which happens because the xenopodes um, were overrepresented. But after this local spread, we can see that the vegetation changes. We can see uh, a change in the taxa, which was caused by climate, and this climate change also um, produced the drop of the lake level. So with this, I'd like to come to my conclusions. So in general, we had a dominance of steppe vegetation in the whole study area. There was not a dense Mediterranean woodland, but rather only a patchy distribution of Mediterranean woodland. Um, so the trees and shrubs were probably distributed at um, habitats which were moister than other places. So this is a strong contrast to the Holocene. And it also disproves previous hypotheses about the paleovegetation of the southern Levant during the last glacial. Our results show, um, or they do not give evidence for uh, vegetation and precipitation gradient like we see it today. And the results suggest sim semi-arid conditions um, prevailed on the whole study area. So we have no evidence for increased precipitation, or at least no evidence for more water which was available for plants. Um, so we think that evaporation was indeed a very um, important factor for the climate. Um, I also want to point to a poster which will be presented on Friday evening by my colleague uh, Chun Su Chen, uh, which deals um, with the interglacial part of the Dead Sea. So you're welcome to join to the poster presentation. And I'd like to thank um, some colleagues and funding agencies and also you for listening. Thank you. Um, so the question or the comment was that temperature was maybe the most important part which caused the vegetation th uh, change. But we think that temperature alone cannot um, solve this problem because if just the temperature would have changed, we would expect another um, vegetation. For example, if it was just very cold but wet, there would be maybe um, some coniferous uh, forests or other trees and shrubs. So there would be a change in the vegetation, but not like that. So there might be also other um, reasons. We also discussed that, that for some reason the water was not available to the plants because it was maybe, um, yeah, or it came down as snow and was not available or as flash floods. But temperature alone, I think, cannot solve the problem. It, of course, um, yeah, it affected the evaporation, but we have uh, three records in Lebanon that, for which we have made um, uh, climate reconstruction, quantified climate reconstructions, and we found out that you have to decrease the temperature even if you keep the, the, precipita the annual precipitation at the same level as today or slightly lower. If you decrease the temperature, you would have that kind of, um, of uh, vegetation. So if you play with, with temperature and the seasonality of precipitation, you would get something really different. There is a poster, the first poster when you leave this room about the uh, Lebanon uh, climate reconstruction if you want to have more information. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. So the, the aim of my uh, talk is to present you the, the early um, Holocene vegetation history in, uh, in, the, in Southern Caucasus. And we will focus on the delayed expansion of uh, forests. So timing, the, the timing of uh, afforestation in uh, Eastern Europe and uh, in, the middle, in the Middle East uh, ha has already been um, investigated by uh, Wright and uh, co-authors, and then by Jamali and co-authors. And um, you can see in, the, in this synthetic uh, diagram with, the different, with different records, uh, pollen records in lakes, that in several lakes in, uh, in Turkey or in, um, 
Iran, you have a delay between the transition between late glacial and the Holocene, and the forest expansion uh, in, that, in that region. So the, the interpretation of the different authors were sometimes different, but they uh, all concluded to, um, to, an, uh, arid, to arid climatic conditions during the early Holocene. So let's move uh, to the South Caucasus. Uh, in that region, we, we are mainly working in Georgia and in Armenia, so we are just northward to the Middle East in, the, in this part of the region. The region exhibits uh, uh, a lot of ecological conditions. You have in the central part, central part of, the Caucasus, of the southern Caucasus um, is um, dominated by forest, um, deciduous and coniferous forest. The eastern part is, uh, is dominated by uh, steppic uh, environment here in yellow and uh, semi-desert uh, formation here in orange. And the western part of the region, so the, which is called Colchis region, uh, is mainly dominated by um, subtropical forest and this region played the role of um, glacial tree refu refugia during the past glacial phases. Of course, previous parent studies have already been undertaken in the, um, in the Southern Caucasus. And um, this um, pollen analysis uh, were carried out, carried out on a small lake and temp temporary lakes. And uh, the problem in that case is that the, pollen value, the tree pollen grains values is uh, very low. As you can see here, the AP value, trees and shrubs, was very low um, in the, oh, along the sequence. And uh, using this kind of data, you can imagine that it could be quite challenging to, to reconstruct the forest um, dynamics. So we have collected different cores in greater, uh, larger lakes and uh, larger wetlands in the Caucasus. We have, for the moment, five um, sequences. And I will talk today about two sequences in Georgia, Paravani and Naryani, and another sequence uh, in Armenia called Zarishat. This is the first sequence. So this sequence is called uh, Paravani. It's, in, it's located in, the, in southern Georgia at 2,000 in elevation, 2,000 meters. And you can see here, so we have the, so the, the sequence spans uh, more than 12 uh, millennia. And if we co focus on the lower part, you can see that there's a, um, there's a first phase dominated by stepic elements, so completely Stepic, uh, completely stepic phase, followed by uh, the simultaneous um, expansion of the different trees uh, around 8,500 uh, year, years um, BP, Cal BP. And um, so you can see on this first sequence that in the Caucasus we have the same, uh, not the same, but a forest, uh, a delay in the forest expansion as we have seen in the, in the middle, for the Middle East. If we look to the sequence of Zarishat, we, we have quite similar um, dynamic with a stepic environment before 8,200 and then the expansion of trees. And this, this shift is also uh, well, marked, well um, characterized by the expansion of uh, hygrophilus uh, plants like CPRC. Let's go back to, to Georgia with the sequence of Nariani. In this, in this sequence, we have also a huge part of the sequence dominated by stepic environment with a lot of Kenopodiaceae. But in that case, we have a, a, an over phase at the end of the stepic phase with the decrease of Kenopodiaceae and the increase of Poaceae, you can see here, probably affecting uh, a, a light 
uh, in a light rise uh, in, uh, in moisture uh, at the end of this stepic part. And then, uh, like in the previous sequence, you have quite simultaneous expansion of the different trees, more coniferous trees than in the previous sequence. In this, uh, on this um, slide, we have compared uh, the um, different curves from the Lake, lake Van uh, sequence with uh, our um, own sequences, Nariani and Paravani. And you can see that the stepic plants have quite similar trends uh, between Van and Nariani, and the same for the Poaceae trends, showing the slight increase probably of uh, moisture here. And then we have also compared the uh, tree, the, the, the AP value, so the arboreal pollen uh, sum uh, in Ariani here and in Paravani with um, a core collected in the, in the Black Sea. And you can see that we have quite similar pattern with a, a delay of more than two and sometimes three millennia between the late glacial Holocene transition and the forest expansion. But the problem is that if we look to the, the isotopic records um, from the Sofular stalagmites in Turkey on the Black Sea shore, you can see that the, the climatic, the climatic uh, shift is not here like in our records, but at the beginning of the Holocene, at the good place, uh, I would say. So the problem is that how to, to understand this delay in that region. We suggest uh, to discuss today three possible forcing fa factors, the time lag in tree migration, the impact of early Holocene burning, and the seasonality of precipitation. So let's have a look to the first hypothesis, the time lag in tree migration. So in the Caucasus, the main tree ref refugia uh, are located in uh, Colchis lowland here. And um, you have, for, inst for instance, here a, a pollen record coming from that area. And you can see that even during the, the younger Julias, you have a lot of AP, arboreal pollen, and uh, the, the trees are well recorded in the refugia. These refugia are, are, are located uh, less than 200 kilometers far from our records. And there is no high mountains between them and our records. So that's the reason why, as soon as the climatic conditions were favorable for trees growing, all the, um, the trees um, arrived in their uh, different altitud altitudinal uh, belt in that region. So apparently, sorry, there is no time lag in tree migration. The, the second uh, hypothesis um, is based on the, the impact of early Holocene burning. The, the, the role played by grassland burning as a break on the woodland expansion during the early Holocene was already investigated by different authors for the Middle East because there were a lot of micro charcoals in the early Holocene uh, records. But in, uh, in the Caucasus, we, have a, we can have a look to the sequence uh, studied by um, Simon Connor in, in Georgia called uh, Lake Aligol. And in that sequence, you can see that during the early Holocene, there is no microcharcoal. And of course, we have done the same analysis, but for microcharcoal in uh, Zarishat in uh, Armenia. And for the, the early Holocene part, the lower, lower part of the sequence, there is known microcharcoal. So in Georgia, if, sorry, in the Caucasus, the, the, this kind of hypothesis uh, apparently is not really relevant for the moment, I would say. The third hypothesis is a um, climatic hypothesis. And uh, so according to our record, we uh, would say that uh, we have a arid uh, climatic, we have arid climatic condition during the early Holocene. But if we look to the geochemical um, lake level indicators and stalagmite records, they all point out uh, high lake levels at that time and um, an increase in annual rainfall. So 
something uh, really different than our record. As you can see, sorry, here. So, our hypothesis is that uh, the, the higher um, annual uh, precipitation uh, were not distributed, sorry, were not distributed um, like that, but, no, thank you. Um, there were, uh, so you can have a higher um, annual uh, precipitation, but uh, with, without enough precipitation during April, May, and June, so during the, uh, the tree growing season. That means that we, are, we agree to say that there were a higher precipitation, but not distributed like today, for example. And in that, in that case, of course, uh, if you have precipitation during the winter, during the very early spring, sorry, uh, oh yes, the end of the winter, very early spring and the end of the summer, you can have uh, rain and of course uh, the melting snow that uh, will uh, contribute to um, the rise of lake levels. So what about the, the potential influence of the Black Sea in that story? If we compare the um, the, pollen, uh, the tree pollen curves uh, with the um, oxygen uh, isotopic records of um, Sofular in Turkey on stalagmite, we can see that we have a quite similar trends. And this um, record uh, is not a climatic record, but um, reflects the, the input of Mediterranean water into the Black Sea, uh, leading to the, the conversion of a black lake to the Black Sea. So the question is uh, how this, um, this new um, sea in the region could have affected the um, distribution of the precipitation in our region. So as a conclusion, or more remarks maybe, um, we can see that the seasonality of precipitation is a key uh, to understanding the um, the, the ecological shift we have during the, the early Holocene in the Caucasus. We have seen the potential influence of the Black Sea feeding uh, on the regional climate, but climate, but now it should be tested uh, using um, climatic models, maybe integrating our uh, pollen data. We, we should do it now. We are the, uh, at the first step, I would say. And um, we, all, we, we will also compare with the Caspian Basin, because in the Caspian Basin, we can also have, in the Southern Basin, um, a delay in forest expansion also. And I will conclude just with uh, an opening question, um, because in the Caucasus, we don't have any Neolithic site before 8,300 uh, um, years BP, and there's a strange coincidence with our uh, data showing uh, quite arid uh, spring and summer during the early Holocene. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that very clear um, uh, exposition. Can I, can I ask if you've done charcoal analysis on the Nariani record, follow record? On which record you said? Nariani. No, so yes, of course, the charcoal I, I have talked about uh, are from um, Ali Gold, so Simon Connor works, and Zarishat. But now we would like to have a look to Nariani and Paravani because there's, I have seen in the pollen slides, a lot of micro charcoals coming, I'm sure, from grasses. So we have to, have to, to know, to, to count, and to have a better idea about the story of uh, burning, yes, of course. Yeah, I mean, it is a bit of a, it is an interesting puzzle, but one of the patterns that comes out from elsewhere, for example, in Van, is there, there does seem to be an association between fire and grass pollen. That, that link seems to work at a number of sites. Yeah, so, so in, in the got, Middle East. Since you've got high grass at Nariani, it'll be interesting to know if you have the same relationship there too. Yes, I, I know this, um, this pattern in different tur Turkish lakes in which you have an increase in Poissy values and uh, an increase in, in uh, Charcoal, micro charcoal, no? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to present you our study. The title is Palynology and Paleoecological Interpretation of Core 38, Paleodnisto Valley, Northwestern Black Sea, Initial Results of Poland, Dynatist, and Non Poland Polynomial Studies. 
Marine balinology is the primary tool for correlating land sea climate interaction. Oh, sorry. Interaction and interpreting paleohydrological and anthropogen uh, anthropogenic changes recorded in Holocene Black Sea sediments. The data include pollen and terrestrial spores that originate from vegetation on shore and are transported to the sea by winds and driven transport. Non pollen polynomorphs are also studied. The main goal of this study is to use new polynological data from Core 38 to shed more light on the climate and salinity of the late Pleistocene near Euxinian Black Sea Lake. This study is a continuation of work by Yanko, Moody, Kadurin, Larchenkov in 2014. The new study is still in progress. We show only the first results. Material was obtained as part of Hermes project in 2008. Location of core 38 is shown on figure on the right. Course 38 located at Paleodnista Valley on tectonically stable Ukrainian outer shelf beneath the rim current. Here is core 38 is located among other reference core studied by Yanko et al. in 2014. Gravity core 38 was recovered at water depths 192 meters. Its length, length is 110 centimeters. This core has two lithological units. The first is from 0 to 53 centimeters, like gray mud with shells of um, Mediolus fasiolinus, indicating marine stage of the Black Sea. The, the second is from 55 to 110 centimeters, dark gray mud with shells of Dracena rostriformis, indicating the latest stage of the neo Euxinian lake. 31 samples were studied, 4 in unit 1 and 27 in unit 2. Layer 2 was not present in other cores described by Yanko et al. in 2014. Sorry. Polynomers were prepared for microscope study using the Odessa University method of sample treatment, which is based on the method used at Sapienza University of Rome. Each sample of 2 gram sediments was boiled in 10% solution of hydrochloric acid and treated with cold hydrofluoric acid of 40%. Uh, uh, Lycopodium are spores used for measuring concentration per gram. All obtained data were divided into five groups, trees, shrubs, herbs, spores, and aquatic plants. 37 taxa was obtained in Unit 1, 52 taxa was obtained in Unit 2. Unit 2 with latest Pleistocene age indicate more forest trees and aquatic as in a delta. High concentration of pinus and betula shows cold climate. Elevated concentration of Aerocatsa indicates drainage of Paleodnister River. A feather shows uh, the climate was not very dry. Non-pollen polynomers from Unit 1 um, characterize salinity about 18 psu, and uh, non-pollen polynomer from Unit 2 characterize salinity about 8 psu. Non-pollen polynomer distribution uh, from Core 38 indicate breakage of the latest neo Euxinian lake. Uh, Ostracoda from Unit 1 dominate by marine species, cyclotin reds. Um, Ostracoda from Unit 2 are represented by brackish species only. Foraminifera from Unit 1 are represented by five polyhaline species. Foraminifera from Unit 2 are represented by one oligohaline species. Core 38 provides records of the final stage of the latest neo Euxinian lake. This stage was missing in other cores uh, show on the profile. And conclusions. Course 38 provides new record of the final stage of the latest neo Euxinian lake, 10.2 to 8 kilo years before present. This stage was missing in other cores show on the profile, except of core 2411, recovered at water depths 435 meters. 
Score 38 is a near reference score 45 and extends downwards the sedimentological, macro and micro paleontological and non pollen polynomials records showing a lake strand breakage environment like that of present Caspian Sea for final stage of the latest Neoxenian lake. It indicates the boundary between the latest Neoplastocene and Holocene being between 9 and 10 kilo years. This match is published the new data on Ostracots and Foraminifera and it shows that Lingolodinum was already present in before marine reconnection of Black Sea with Marma Sea. This study is a part of Hermes project and this paper is a contribution to IGCP 710 project. Uh, also thanks to Yefen Rhosin for help with pollen diagrams. And uh, thank you for your attention. that 41 samples were studied, but I am interested to know how much pollen grains was in samples from marine sediments, uh, from Palia Nestr Valley of Black Sea, 100, 200 or more? Um, it's about... Um, um, ten species trees. Thank you. So hi, I'm Tree, um, and I'm going to show you a little story from a modeling perspective on my ongoing PhD um, program. So um, the Caspian Sea Basin, it's located between um, Europe and Asia with a, with a semi-arid climate. It's the world's largest closed basin fed by 130 rivers of which the, uh, the Volga River is the um, contributing 80% of the runoff, um, contributing into the Caspian Sea level. Um, so the red outline over here shows the um, Caspian Sea Basin with the four major rivers, the Volga, Ural, Kura, and Tarik. Climate-driven periods of isolation and overflow caused unique biodiversity and sea level uh, threats in the Caspian. So um, in the past, from 1900 to 2002. Um, at, at present, the Caspian Sea is uh, 27 meters below the global ocean sea level, but in the past, it wasn't always the case. So from 1900 to, um, 1900 to 1980, there has been a steady decline of about three meters of the Caspian Sea level. And then in the next 20 years, there's been a rapid increase of about two and a half meters. Um, there's no general consensus on how this evolves for the future. And um, this caused drastic impacts on the economy, agriculture, coastal people, and the ecosystem, and we're interested to see how it evolves in the future. So the, um, the Caspian sea level is debated to arise from um, changes in precipitation and evaporation balance. This is mostly impacted by teleconnections. And um, teleconnections are large-scale atmospheric um, circulation variabilities which strongly influence the regional temperature and precipitation of an area, such as the Atlantic teleconnections. Um, the two major modes are uh, North Atlantic oscillation and the East Atlantic pattern. So what happens is um, there's differences in sea level pressure um, variabilities giving rise to strengths in westerly winds which um, control a warmer or wetter um, climatic conditions or a drier and a, and a colder one and this has implications on the Caspian hydroclimate. So the major aim of our study was to understand the sensitivity of the Caspian Sea uh, climate simulation to model resolution and which climatic pattern influences the uh, Caspian Sea basin and why. And the way we did this was with the use of the community earth system climate model. So this is a, um, a coupled global IPCC kind of climate model um, which um, stimulates the Earth's past, present, and future through computer simulations. And um, we do this by looking at changes in uh, different components of, of the model, which is made up of different models. So you have your um, atmosphere, and you have your atmospheric model for this, uh, 
we use CAM4 or CAM5 based on different model physics. Then we look at the land or vegetation changes to the community land model, and then you have your community ice model, your ocean model, river model, and they all um, interchange information through, through a coupler. Um, we performed five series of experiments over different model versions, resolutions, and periods. So the first three have to do with um, pre-industrial um, type of design with CAM4 or CAM5 at two or one degree from 1850 to 2000. And the last two are the representative concentration pathways of RCP 4.5, which is um, an IPCC kind of feature scenario which shows a, um, which is based on anthropogenic greenhouse gas fossings, um, which show it being peaked at 2014 and um, stabilizing at the end of the century. The RCP 8.5 is more of a uh, high-end scenario whereby the um, emissions keep on raising and raising and not stabilizing, and we're interested to see um, the impact of this on the Caspian Sea uh, Basin. So the first thing we did was look at um, one of the most um, common and basic model uh, output variables, the two-meter temperature. Um, so what you see over here is the uh, reanalysis at 0 0.5 um, uh, degrees of grid from 1900 to 2000 with values in uh, degrees Celsius. Um, what we do is we um, show all model outputs and try to compare it to the reanalysis. So we have the two degree CAM4 version of the model which um, overemphasizes or shows a bias of about three meters over the uh, over the northern part of the Caspian, and this is quite, uh, quite acceptable given the two degree status uh, of the model. Um, at one degree CAM4, it gets a little bit better, but not so much. The one degree CAM5 is the one that is at the present um, able to capture the best possible temperature, especially over the northern Caspian, um, giving us confidence to choose this version of the model with enhanced physics to um, take it to the future scenarios. So if we see how the future temperature evolves for this region under RCP 4.5 and 8.5, and it is as uh, what we expect, so there's increased warming over the Caspian Sea and onto the um, eastern side of the Caspian. Um, the next thing we tried to understand was the evaporation minus precipitation flux because this gives us an idea of how the Caspian Sea levels uh, vary through time. So again, the first one is the 0 0.5 degree um, reanalysis data from 1979 to 2000 with um, values indicated in millimeters per day. Um, we compare this to the model 2 degree CAM4 for the same time frame and the model 1 degree CAM4 for the same time frame. And we see that it, um, it doesn't capture the variability uh, circled around the Caucasus. So uh, the Caucasus is about 3,000 meters high and the model has um, an issue capturing the topographical, orographical features. But um, the evaporation over the Caspian Sea is quite high. And the same pattern is seen for 1 degree CAM5. Now, if we try to see this uh, relationship in the future, we see that the uh, evaporation over the Caspian Sea increases um, quite a lot. And in the RCP 8.5, we see that there's somewhat of a compensating impact from increased evaporation over the northern basin of the Caspian. Um, this is where the Volga is and um, an increased evaporation over the um, Caspian Sea itself. The next thing that we tried to understand was um, how do the actual teleconnections occur in this, um, in this region. So we took the atmospheric sea level pressure, and what you see over here is um, our reanalysis um, sea level pressure patterns. Um, so the major mode is um, captured uh, at 47.4% of variance by NAO, which is, um, again, a very typical dipole feature captured by the model, and the Caspian Sea Basin is outlined in um, black. And uh, for the Eastern Atlantic, we have 14.5% of the variance captured by, uh, by the model with the um, 
with the center in the Eastern Atlantic region, which is the way it should be. Now we try to see if the model uh, could capture this or not. And over here, only one degree CAM5 is shown, but we've performed this um, analysis on all version experiments of the model and found this to be the best representative pattern. So for the model, it shows that it is able to uh, capture about 46.5% uh, of the variance captured by the NAO, and it shows the two differing um, modes uh, or centers of positive and negative um, and has a typical dipole feature. Um, and it does a reasonable job in reproducing the Eastern Atlantic pattern as well. Being somewhat satisfied with the model behavior at this stage, we uh, proceeded to um, one of the um, final stages of the analysis, which is to see how this influences the E minus B trend. We're interested to see this because um, the NEO could influence um, higher than average precipitation or less, therefore influencing the Caspian sea level at different times. So this is for 1979 to 2000 for the for the reanalysis stage. And what you see over here is um, the Caspian Sea again outlined in, in black. And on this part is the, um, the basin of the Volga, which again contributes 80% of water into the Caspian Sea. So it was important to understand how it actually influences this area of the, of the Caspian Sea. And judging from this, it causes um, above average precipitation over the Caspian Sea. And uh, the pattern is somewhat, um, in opposite to the trend we see on the Eastern Atlantic. Now, we try to see as one form of model evaluation of how the model does in comparison to the observations and it is somehow um, uh, somewhat captures the large scale feature. So you have um, increased precipitation over the, uh, over the Volga and a decrease under Eastern Atlantic pattern. So, um, we, uh, we see minimum impacts of uh, cancellation at this period, but if we um, take the model to see for the entire period from 1850 to 2000, um, under these patterns, we see the same pattern persist. So you have um, somewhat of higher precipitation over the Volga and um, under the influence of NAO. And under the influence of uh, Eastern Atlantic, you have um, uh, less precipitation over the Volga. Now, um, when we look at the corresponding time series that come with this, um, so this is supposed to give you a, an idea of a relationship of how the teleconnection evolves through time, but um, when we performed several statistical uh, analysis to understand the significance of the relationship, we were not able to find any, um, so it doesn't have the NAO, the Eastern Atlantic, and the E minus P doesn't have any trend for the period of 1850 to, to 2000. The last section of the presentation deals with the future scenarios. So the RCP 4.5 from 2020 to 2100. So again, we have our uh, sea level pressure anomaly patterns over the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, we again see the typical dipole feature of the NAO, but it seems to have a, uh, a eastward, um, eastward shift in the centers at 47.3% of the variance. And uh, the same thing is seen for the Eastern Atlantic, whereby you um, see an eastward shift of the, of the center um, of this. And this is also shown in other studies and other models. The corresponding time series also um, a decreasing time. But because we were not able to have any statistical significance, we, um, we were not able to say if there is a trend or not in association with this. To see the associated influence of the NAO in Eastern Atlantic on the E minus P, we um, analyzed patterns whereby, again, like in previous patterns at current stage, we have an increase of uh, precipitation over the Volga and a decrease under the Eastern Atlantic. Um, and this seems to intensify compared to the 1850 to 2000 um, time. Now, the last part is to see the same relationship under the RCP 8.5 scenario. And in this one, we see a more pronounced eastward shift of the NAO at 41.8% of the variance captured. So the model is still able to capture uh, the NAO as the major variability in the Atlantic area. And the Eastern Atlantic um, variance increases at 19.1. But in both cases, there's a eastward shift of the um, of these patterns. 
the corresponding time series, um, surprisingly for the NAO, shows an increased trend, which we were able to find as significant, but the Eastern Atlantic and the E minus B were still uh, not significant, so uh, we were not able to find any trend there. And lastly, when we try to look at the influence from these patterns onto the E minus B, um, to understand how it evolves, we found that um, uh, precipitation still increases over the um, over the Volga, but um, there seems to be a compensating or a cancelling effect over the um, one part of the southern basin, and the effects uh, under the eastern Atlantic influence are seem to uh, be of a compensating or a cancelling effect. Um, to summarize. So, um, so far we found out that the CESM 1.2.2 1 degree CAM5 high resolution captures adequate climate on the Caspian Basin. Um, the NEO influences increased precipitation over the Volga Basin, but uh, this could be compensated for by increased evaporation over the Caspian Sea itself by 2100. And this then would mean that um, there is a net cancelling um, influence onto the E-P budget over the Caspian Basin, meaning that most likely the Caspian sea level may remain constant by 2100. And lastly, the NEO uh, shows no trend under RCP 4.5, but an increased trend under RCP 8.5 with no trend in E-P by 2100 um, due to opposing trends in the sub-basins. Thank you.